Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the IOSH Humber Brands presentation, which is going to be on the proposed safety bill delivered by um, Rianne Greaves, who's the legal director at DACB, uh, DAC Beechcroft. So I hope you're all well, and thank you for taking the time out and joining us. So just um, a, a, some minor housekeeping issues. Well, again, we are um, still having no face-to-face -face meetings until 2022, where we are currently in discussions with IOSH HQ to see how we're going to um, propose and deliver those meetings. So watch this space and we'll get some further information out to you as and when. Um, uh, just a few number of housekeeping issues if if you've got vpn and um, please turn off your vpn if you've got a weak wi-fi signal then by turning off your video may help you receive a better signal this meeting will be locked after 10 minutes so if you do drop out and you'll not be able to rejoin i'm afraid and if you are planning to attend any future meetings then please make sure you join us on time and uh, again there will also be locked out after 10 minutes if you do have any questions, please use the chat function to post your questions. We'll then collate those questions and pose them to Rianne at the end of the presentation. If there is any questions that we don't have time to answer due to our time frame, um, we'll send them questions over to Rianne, who will then very kindly answer them questions and send them back. And Ellen will post them onto our microsite for you all to see. A copy of Rianne's presentation will also be sent to IOSH who will upload that onto our microsite so that will be available for you in due course but please bear with us while we have to get that sent over and then get the arrangements made for it to be displayed on our microsite but it will be there normally within three to five days after the presentation if, if you don't mind. Um, if we've got any new members who's joined us this morning, welcome. Um, big welcome to the IOSH Humber region. Hope you enjoy our presentations and we look forward to meeting you soon face to face. Um, and that's it uh, for our introduction. Um, I'll mention this again at the end of the presentation, but our next meeting will be Wednesday, the 1st of December 21, where we have our very own committee member Matthew Brekow will be presenting our legal update, our annual legal update. So it's always well attended is that one. So um, please uh, make sure you register for that when uh, the event comes out and is available to you. So without further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Rianne, who's going to deliver the presentation on the proposed safety bill. Thank you very much, Rianne. Over to you. Much and thanks for uh, letting me join you this morning. Um, I am just going to. Rihanna, we can't actually hear you very well. You, I think your mic's not working. Oh. We'll just check it's connected, okay? Yeah, I haven't. Can you hear oh. me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, must have just come loose slightly. So I'm just going to see if I can uh, share my screen with you. Hopefully, uh, there we go. Can you can you see that now? Rianne, you just need to change your display settings again. Okay, sorry. Um, just bear with me. Yep, that's there we better. Go. Perfect. Thank you. There we go. So you can see the slides now and not the notes. Is that right? <laughs> yep. Thank you. Okay. Right. So after the technical hitches, apologies for that. Uh, morning everyone, thanks for letting me join you this morning. Um, my name is Rian Greaves, I'm a colleague of Matthews at DAC Beechcroft uh, and I'm based uh, over in the Manchester office. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview this morning of the new building safety regime um, that is currently making its way through Parliament. Um, there is quite a lot in the bill. Um, I made the mistake of printing it off. Um, which um, wasn't the most environmentally sound decision, which is absolutely huge. And it's very easy to look at this bill and to become uh, overwhelmed, I think, by just the sheer scale of, uh, of the, the, the proposals. Um, so what we're going to do today is just have a, a quick overview of, uh, of, of where the bills come from and what we might expect. Um, the, the, the bill uh, 
as it stands at the moment, is largely based on um, Judith Hackett's initial report, um, which of course followed the, the tragedy at Grenfell. Um, and it looks at how we have gone about building in the past, how we've gone about using buildings, how we've maintained them, how we've managed them. Um, and it looks really to bring about a complete overhaul of the way in which this sector will work going forward. And the important thing to say at the moment is it is just a bill. It's not yet an act of parliament. It's not yet the law. Um, but bearing in mind its origins, it's very clear that the political will and the public will exists to enact the bill in this form or something like it. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we're already talking to organisations about the bill, even though it's not yet a law. Um, because there is going to be quite a lot for some businesses to do to get themselves ready. Um, and so it's really prudent to understand what does it look like, how might it affect um, organisations going forward. So we're just going to, as I say, look at the um, look, look at the structure of it and what, what's involved. And I've included on the overview slide there really what, what we'll be looking at today. So um, the, the anticipated scope of the regime. Um, when we think things are going to happen, when we think it's actually going to become a law, um, and then to look at some of the more detailed provisions around um, the information that's going to be expected to be compiled in relation to buildings around the new duty holder regime, um, and also importantly the impact uh, on fire safety, and we'll see that the bill also strengthens some of the existing fire safety legislation um, which really goes hand in hand with, as I say, the, the origins of where the bill has come from. So the key theme, really, that's notable is that what, what we're going to be asked to do as a society going forward is to look at look at the buildings. So I've included the, the quote on the slide there. When we build, let us think that we build forever, not just for present use alone. And that's really the, the, the key that runs right through everything that, that, that we're going to touch on this morning, um, which is to consider the full life cycle of the building from the moment it's first conceived of, right through to it being constructed, inhabited, and then maybe in future, um, the, the use of that building being changed. So for example, we can see a bit of a phenomenon happening now where we've got lots of empty spaces in town centres or retail units, some of those being repurposed for residential use, for example. So to think about how a building might be used, not just for its existing purpose or its proposed purpose, but also think about where it, where it might end up and how that might look. We can also see that there's going to be a formalisation, really, uh, of, of roles and new legal, new legal roles being created for people who have a role in managing particularly high-rise residential buildings. Um, we can see that there's going to be a big focus also on competence, which of course will be something that's very familiar to all of you. Um, there's going to be a big focus on competence, not just the people managing residential buildings once they've been constructed, but also during the construction phase, also during the design phase, um, and we might see a bit more description around that than perhaps we've been used to in the past from the HSE. And um, we're going to see uh, a new regulator, so we'll touch upon that, I'm sure if you're all aware, the HSE is also a, a new division, the Building Safety Regulator, so we'll touch upon that later. We're going to see a stronger voice for residents of these buildings um, in the system, but also some legal duties to them, which is interesting. Um, and as I say, we're going, we're going to see new enforcement and regulatory powers. Now, Although, as I've said, the bill is absolutely enormous in its scope at the moment, there is a huge amount more detail to come. Um, and many, many of the bill's provisions will be fleshed out by um, statutory instruments, by regulations, by codes of practice. And there is also, as I'm sure you're aware, a lot of consultation going on at the moment around many of these issues. So what we can do at the moment is we can look at how things look now, we can also identify, however, that there's going to be a fair amount of detail that will, will follow in due course. Now, depending on the size of your screen will depend how, um, how helpful this slide is to you, but when you, when you get the slides on your microsite, you'll be able to see that this is the government's rough estimate of how long this bill will take to enact. Um, the bill was introduced um, in July 
uh, of this year. Uh, and it's been through its first couple of stages in Parliament and it's currently at the committee stage, um, which is the stage at which they start to discuss amendments to the bill um, and some of those that I'll flag in due course. The government's quite optimistic that they, that they might get this through the House um, in spring. I think more realistically, we might be looking at trying to get it through before um, the summer recess of 2022. Um, but what you can then see on this slide is after the bill comes into in play, we will have a period of anywhere between 12 and 18 months for businesses to adapt to the new regime. Now, that sounds like quite a long time, um, but I think as we go through the various provisions of the bill, you will start to see why we as a firm are telling our clients to start to think about it now, because actually some of the, the changes that will be necessary um, will be quite significant from a systems perspective, from a training perspective, from a competence perspective, uh, planning. There's a whole range of stuff to consider. So we are suggesting people start to think about it now. Um, although, as I say, in reality, there will be this, this transition period after the bill has been enacted. So the first, the starting point, I guess, is to look at the scope of the bill as it stands at the moment. Most of the bill um, applies to multi-occupancy high-rise residential buildings, which is perhaps not a surprise given the origins of, of this new proposed law. Um, however, there is the potential for the government to extend this um, definition, if you like, of higher risk buildings to other buildings. Um, and I, I'll talk about that in a moment when we get to the next slide. However, all buildings are impacted in some way by the bill. So for example, the new building safety regulator, which will be part of HSC, there will be general oversight there of building control. So the HSC will basically become in charge of building control. They're going to regulate the competence of building control inspectors. So that whole system will change and the options available to developers will be different um, depending on uh, whether these building control inspectors have been approved um, and they've met the relevant competence criteria, which is currently subject to uh, consultation. Um, as I said, there are going to be new competence requirements for people who are involved in design and construction of buildings. And um, there's currently an ongoing consultation by the British Standards Institute at the moment, looking at what those competence requirements might involve and how they might look. And that's quite interesting, I think, for us as as people involved in health and safety to, to think about the idea of prescription around competence. Obviously, it's something that you'll be dealing with day in, day out, regardless of what industry sector you're in. But you know, if you think particularly around CDM, for example, um, there has never been any particularly prescriptive checklist, for example, of what, what a competent person looks like. Um, for those of you with experience, you will feel like if I know, know what a competent person looks like when I see one. Um, but we, we may see greater description around that. And that will be interesting, really, to, to track that, even if competence around building safety isn't specific to your business. It will be interesting to see how that turns out and whether that has wider implications for how we consider competence in other parts of health and safety law. Um, another area where all buildings will be impacted is we're going to have new requirements around construction product safety and a new, new regulator looking at that. So there are implications regardless of whether you're involved in uh, high-rise high residential or, or not. Although, as I say, most of the um, provisions are aimed at, at, at those high-rise buildings. So when we look at what, what is a higher-risk building, at the moment, and that's why I said what's currently a higher risk building, at the moment, the bill says, uh, basically, we'll, we'll, we'll have two different definitions of what a higher risk building is, depending on what we're doing with the building. So if we're designing, constructing, or refurbishing, a higher risk building is something that's over 18 metres from the ground, um, or at least seven storeys, and um, is described in regulations, which are yet to come, but at this stage include residential property, so uh, a high-rise building with more than two residential units in it, care homes and hospitals. So that's when you're constructing, or when you're looking at new builds. When you've got buildings that are already in occupation, 
A higher risk building is one that's over 18 metres or at least seven storeys and can change at least two residential units. Um, and that will apply to anything that's new, anything that's going up now, and anything that already exists. So for some businesses and organisations, there will have huge housing stock that they've got to go back and look at and um, figure out how this bill applies to them and what they need to do about existing um, buildings. Now, I say what's currently a high risk building. This is something that at the committee stage, an amendment has been proposed to this. Um, and it's also something that's quite hotly debated at the consultation stage for the bill, which is why do we have this prescriptive 18 metres, seven storeys? Why are we not looking at the characteristics of the building? Is there anything about the building that makes it might be, it might not be as high rise as 18 meters or seven stories, but it might have other characteristics which make it particularly high risk. So for example, where buildings are, you know, perhaps old buildings are particularly complicated buildings, um, fire escape routes might not be as, as direct as in a new build, for example. So that that whole theme has come back around again in the uh, in the committee stage and that's going to be looked at now um, as to whether or not that's that that's something that will change i think those of us looking at this in the firm we feel like this is an area where we might see a bit of movement we might see either that 18 meter level come down a little bit or we might see something that, that changes this currently quite simplistic view of, of what what a higher risk building might be but we'll have to watch this space as the, as the debates continue. Now, one of the issues um, that the bill really seeks to address is, is, is the life cycle of the buildings. And what it wants to do with, with higher risk buildings is to create these three gateways. Um, the first one, gateway one, actually is already in place now, and that requires a fire statement um, to be submitted as part of the, the planning process. Um, and as I said, that's in, that's in place now, although interestingly, anecdotally, um, a CDM consultant I work with has had a client put in a fire statement at the planning stage um, this month, or very last month, um, only for it to be returned by the local authority who apparently didn't know what it was. So that's, uh, that, that's quite, quite troubling to say that this, this is part of the bill that's already law at the moment. So you've got to put in this fire statement. Interestingly, also at, at that planning stage, the building safety regulatory, so the HSE will become a statutory consultee for higher risk buildings. So they will have uh, a say. It's almost like you imagine a higher risk building for coma sites, you know, in the same way as they would be a statutory consultee for a coma site, they would be a statutory consultee for higher risk buildings. And um, once you've gone through that first gateway, um, Gateway two is basically the full plans stage of the building regulations as things stand. Um, and at this point, the, the client, uh, so therefore the CDM client, will need to provide information to show the building safety regulator that the building will comply with building regs. So that includes not just full plans, but also um, the construction both health and safety plan, how they're going to maintain safety during construction, how are they going to deal with fire and emergency issues. Um, and there'll have to be a signed declaration from the client um, that both the principal designer and the principal contractor meet competency requirements. Now, interestingly, there's going to be a hard stop here at gateway two. So nothing is going to happen until the regulator is happy that the design complies with the building regulations. So I think we might expect to see that there'll be a little bit of um, a delay, certainly as the building safety regulator gets Brits with their new uh, newfound powers and uh, what, what, what they need to be doing. Gateway three then is when we've got a final, you know, we've got a building that's built, um, it will be up to the client to submit the as built information to the, uh, to the regulator. So to really to update anything that's changed since gateway two. Um, and they will also have to include a declaration signed by the client, again, but also the principal designer and the principal contractor, that to the best of their knowledge, the building complies with building regs. And you will only get a completion certificate from the building safety regulator once they are satisfied that, that, that that's the case. 
um, and you can't inhabit a building until that's happened. So it, it's quite interesting again to see the possibility there of some delays coming into the process. Now, all of that information that has been um, passed between the local authority and the building safety regulator and the client and so forth, that begins to form what's called the golden thread. And this is another key feature of the bill. Um, and again, for you as safety professionals, this will be music for your ears, no doubt. Um, this will be what you're doing day to day in any event. Um, but, for, but for buildings, we now know that actually this hasn't been happening in, in many, many cases. Um, and so they, they've introduced this golden thread idea, which is again with the recommendation from do the packet. And it's basically a tool to manage buildings as a holistic system so that people who come to use the building um, have the information they need to use it safely um, and to operate it safely in the future. And so it's created basically information that we begin to compile it at the inception of the building and it's passed through those gateways that we've just seen on the last slide and um, ultimately to whoever is going to own, manage, operate the building going forward. Um, and or also to make sure that that then forms part of future transactions so that future owners also get to, uh, get, get to understand that information. This was um, the, the golden thread was part of a consultation which actually already concluded. Um, and the, uh, the principles have been set out in what's called the government's golden thread report. And you can see there on that slide the type of themes that they want to make sure this information will be, just to make sure that it is usable for people. So obviously it has to be accurate and trusted. It has to enable residents to feel secure in their, their homes. Importantly, it has to be understandable to them. So you can't blind them with science and technology um, and technical language. You have to make sure that if residents need access to information, they're able to get it and that they can understand it. Um, and number four, I think, is, is important, the single source of truth. So the idea being that, you know, every building should have this controlled package of documents, if you like, um, that will tell anybody coming to, coming to use the building how, how it's been constructed um, and any particular safety issues that, that they need to, to know about. I think the golden thread is going to be something that, that, that businesses are going to want to be looking at now, really, um, because it may be, you know, particularly you know, where you've got huge stock already of, of higher risk buildings, you'll need to start to gather that information, which is always tougher to do than if you're starting from, for, for, with a fresh piece of paper, if you like. Um, but clearly, you know, people will need to think about digital systems, they'll need to think about who's going to be in charge of that process. Um, and how they're going to create that, how they're going to coordinate with other parties that might be involved. So the government is working on guidance at the moment um, and they do acknowledge it's going to take some time to implement, but it is clearly a very key part of um, managing the safety of buildings, but also, uh, as I mentioned at the start, you know, this idea that residents should be much more a part of the system um, you know, help them to understand and for them to feel feel safe in the homes that they, they live in. Now we've had a, a look at um, you know the, the overarching themes, if you like. Um, when we when we come to design and construction, this is much more familiar territory for us as uh, as a safety professionals, um, because it's probably not a surprise that given much of this painting recommendations by Judy Packett that what we've got is very, feels very CDM-like. Um, so there are roles created within the bill that are the same as the CDM roles. So we see client, principal designer, principal contractor, designer, and contractor. Um, and what is encouraged through the bill um, is that we have, um, you know, specification as to who's going to be appointed, when the competence piece of course that we talked about um, a few moments ago, um, and all of that has to be has to be in place before building control building control approval is is sought. Um, and so, yeah, as I say, for, for for most of us dealing with health and safety, that's much more familiar territory. 
And to be honest, with a lot of clients we're talking to, they seem quite favourable to this approach because it is familiar. Um, I think CVM in its current iteration is probably, you know, now we feel like it finally has bedded in in a way that perhaps the earlier steps of CVM regulations haven't. It's well understood. People can see the benefits of it. Um, and I think basing the, the, you know, the building safety regime from a construction perspective on CVM uh, makes complete sense. Once we've got a building that is in occupation, we have then got a couple of new legal roles to think about. The first being an accountable person. Um, and it's important to bear in mind that these two roles I'm going to talk to you about, the accountable person and the business safety manager, they are in addition then to the responsible person for, from a fire safety perspective. So there is a little bit of sitting down to do to sort of um, identify how you're going to make this work on an organisation by organisation basis. Not to say that you know we can't have shared roles and we can't have corporate appointees, of course you can, um, but you just do need to have a, have, have a little think about it and think about particularly, for example, whether there are training requirements for individuals that you will ask to take on certain aspects of, of these um, corporate roles. So to look at the accountable person, these are, this is a role that applies when a building is in occupation. So the accountable person, um, as I say, can be, can be a business, um, and usually the person is going to be in possession of the common part or maintenance and repair of, of of common parts. So you might have a number of accountable persons. And again, that's in common with fire safety. Of course, we're, we're familiar with the idea that there's more than one responsible person for building. We can have more than one accountable person from a building safety perspective as well. Um, where, where that happens, we, we will effectively appoint a principal accountable person for, for a particular building. Um, and so the responsibility of the, the accountable person is to register the completed building. So all, all completed higher risk buildings will have to be registered with, with the HSE, with the Building Safety Regulator. Um, and one of the key roles that they will have is to produce a safety case, which again is familiar territory for, for many of you, I'm sure, um, but is brand new for uh, the property side of, of, of things. They have to produce a safety case, which we'll look at briefly in a second. They have to appoint a building safety manager um, and they have to uh, establish uh, a mandatory occurrence reporting system for, for, for when things happen. And they will also need to engage with residents and maintain an engagement strategy. And that's the theme that we see coming through the bill really, is the need not just to have residents as incidental to a, a building, but to have them front and centre so that they feel like they understand where they live and that they can um, they can ask for information and they can be, be, be given the, the information. Okay. So the safety case is, is interesting. Um, sorry, the safety case is interesting. Um, the HSC have just produced some, some information on that, which I'll, I'll cover um, in, in a slide, slide or so time. The, the, the accountable person has to appoint a building safety manager. So you can imagine the accountable person is kind of like the corporate overseeing body, if you like. The building safety manager is doing, so the building safety manager is day-to-day, -day fire safety, structural safety, overseeing how things are happening in the building, managing in accordance with the safety report. Now, again, that can be, the building safety manager can be a corporate entity. So you might have, for example, facilities management uh, business that is the building safety manager but it's important to make sure that there will have to be you know an identifiable individual for residents to go to so not that they're taking on all of that corporate responsibility themselves the individual but that there is somebody identifiable that a resident can go to if they have a, a question or a, a complaint or concern of any sort so the building safety manager is really the day-to-day -day management. They will have that coordinating role, understanding what's happening, liaising with the accountable person if something happens which jeopardizes the safety case in some way or if the safety case becomes invalid in, in any particular way, that would be up to the building safety manager to 
which as I say, there is likely to be trading requirements now with the people taking on these new roles. Now, when it comes to the safety case, the, the HSE has just published um, in the last couple of weeks the principles that they will be using um, when they are considering safety cases. Um, and yeah, as I say, it's going to be interesting to see how this goes in because this will be quite a new concept for many of uh, many people who end up doing these safety cases. This will be brand new for them. So they've set out various principles um, that they expect. Um, a council person to follow when they're putting together their safety cases. Um, effectively, they, they recommend a systematic review of the building so that you understand where the risks are um, and how significant those risks might be. Um, and so, you know, bearing in mind, as we all know, um, you know, major hazards tend to be a combination of failures. So, looking at what could go wrong, how it could go wrong, and how significant the impact could be. Now, the, the, the document from the HSE talks about not only a safety case, which is the information used to manage the risk of fire spreading structural safety in the building, um, but they also talk about safety reports as well. So we've got a safety case, um, which requires you as said, to think about major accident hazards, um, but also a safety case report, which is a document basically summarizing the safety case and shows what you are doing about it. Um, and you can see again when we look at the, the, the third bullet point there, safety case reports should not be uh, a collection of individual reports compiled without narrative reference or context. But if we look back to when we talked about the, the golden thread a few slides ago, you can see this is all about making sure that when you know we're not just collecting it and putting the box to say yes, we've got that information, we are collating valuable, usable, accessible, understandable information so that people coming into the building can, can, can do what they need to do and can do it with a full understanding of any hazards, any risks that, that, that may pose themselves. You can't have an overly technical or complex document. Um, can't have a copy and paste. I know that is a bugbear of all of ours. Uh, copy and paste from another building safety case. You know, this is, you know, the, the building safety version of the generic risk assessment. You can't do that. It's got to be specific to the building. So that's quite a detailed document and it's just been published by, by the HSC. So very much something that everybody is still getting to grips with. Um, and interestingly, um, the HSC are still um, asking for views. So there is still a little bit of time. You'll see at the bottom of the slide there. And they're asking for views in terms of good practice and sharing examples by the 22nd of October of, of this month. Um, so that you know, so they're, they're still open to, to discussion on that. But you can see very much from the slides that what we're talking about is um, accountability and accessibility and being understandable. Um, Residents uh, are a much bigger part of um, the, the building safety bill, perhaps understandably, um, than they have been previously. Um, independent review into building safety found basically that residents didn't feel they had a strong enough voice in safe management of their homes, and they didn't feel I had an uh, opportunity or sufficient opportunity to offer views and participate in decision making on came to where they live. And so, um, the accountable person is going to be under a legal obligation to prepare um, and maintain a residence engagement strategy, which residents must have a copy of. They must be providing safety information to residents on request, and they've got to have a safety, uh, sorry, a complaint process in place so that safety concerns can be raised. On the flip side of that, there are also going to be duties on residents, uh, legal duties on residents. So duties on the uh, residents to make sure that they're not acting in a way that creates significant building safety risks. They're not interfering with safety items where um, the accountable person asks them to do something that that is done. Um, and there will be um, you know, uh, the ability to, to, to apply to the court for orders if the residents don't do that. So for example, need to get into a property in order to maintain fire safety equipment, uh, change fire doors, those sorts of things 
um, there will be uh, the, on the flip side that's a legal duty on the resident and the, the, the business will be able to enforce that um, if there are any issues. Uh, residents will say going to be required to pay for repairs or replacements if they are in breach of any of their obligations um, under, under the bill. So I think it's interesting that whilst there was, there was obviously this much more emphasis on residents and providing them with information, on the flip side there's also some formalisation around what they'll be expected to, to do in all of this. Um, and to support the, the full whole system approach to building management, um, the bill also includes some uh, amendments to the regulatory reform fire safety order, which we all know and love. Um, and that means that responsible persons going forward will have to record, record their fire risk assessment rather than just significant findings. Um, they are going to have to look at competence. Now, you know, much of this is already happening in some cases, not, not in all. Um, but, you know, we don't again see this, this competence requirement, recording fire safety arrangements, providing fire safety information for residents. Uh, make sure, again, a bit of formalisation around the, the cooperation that's needed. So taking reasonable steps to identify themselves to put their responsible persons where you've got multi occupancy buildings um, and passing on fire safety information. So if a responsible person is, you know, departing a building, making sure that the information is there to enable the next business or organisation coming in to manage things uh, appropriately. And also it's important to note that the Fire Safety Act, um, there is a the new Fire Safety Act, which really clarifies the um, scope and extent of the fire safety order. So that's now been extended to cover the building structure, external walls, doors between domestic premises and common parks, you know, all of those kind of gray areas that existed before. Um, they have now been resolved by the Fire Safety Act. So we, we, we do see those changes coming in. And again, there's going to be more guidance, there are consultations ongoing in that respect as well. But fire safety is clearly a very, very important part of um, the, the whole building safety picture. In terms of enforcement, there are going to be three main agencies involved, the building safety regulator, currently being tested within the HSA. Obviously, the Fire and Rescue Service, um, who already have existing enforcement obligations under the Fire Safety Order, and also the Office of Product Safety and Standards, who will have a new market surveillance role for the safety of construction products. So there is a whole piece around construction products, um, which, um, which will be enforced by the OPSS that we will see in the report. The building safety regulator is obviously the main one um, that we're all uh, concentrating on and, and looking at the new national regulator, which will be responsible for all regulatory decisions under the new regime um, during design, construction, occupation, refurbishment um, of high risk buildings. Um, and also beyond high risk buildings, as we said at the start, they will also have the building control function. Um, you know, there's a massive amount for the BFR to do. And so, for example, they can suspend or remove building inspectors, they can prosecute building inspectors, um, they're going to be key to the, uh, the competence requirement, they're going to have to maintain a register of building control inspectors. Um, so there's an absolutely huge amount of work to be done. Um, but the idea will be that we will have this one specialist regulator then um, into the future, which will hopefully be equipped to, to meet the challenges and take that overview, which I think is, is perhaps one of the areas that's been missing in terms of how, how these buildings are, are regulated. They will have the ability to issue stop notices for non-compliant projects um, and compliance notices to apply to apply non-compliance to be rectified. And they'd be very much akin to and if uh, prohibition notices and improvement notices that we are already familiar with. Um, the early indications from the BSR is that they'll be looking to regulate by cooperation um, rather than going straight to prosecution, but of course they will be able to prosecute, so they will have you know, all of the powers of the HSE when it comes to prosecuting. 
Um, I think the hope is that because they will be involved from inception right through to the conclusion of the building and beyond, that in theory, um, there is the opportunity to discuss and iron out issues and hopefully avoid breaches arising. So that would be nice. Um, but obviously, inevitably, there will, there will be some prosecutions that arise from this. Um, and they're going to be funded on a full cost recovery approach. So we will see fees for intervention uh, for their work, just in the same way as we do for existing HSC uh, work. Um, just in terms of some other issues that are, are likely to, to pop up, um, and as I say, it's very difficult to try and do an overview of this bill because it's so enormous. Um, but there will be some new covenants that have to go into leases for all higher risk buildings. Um, where landlords want to make written demands for rent, they have to contain any uh, relevant building safety information. Um, there will be the ability for the HSC or sorry, the BFR to apply special measures orders if they're concerned about the way an occupied building has been managed. Um, we've already referenced the, the fire safety law being strengthened. There's also a consultation ongoing at the moment about a developer levy um, to help fund remediation by planning removal of fires. You know, that, that's obviously a huge part of the bill. And um, you've already have seen that um, the bill proposes to um, increase the time for making claims under the Defective Premises Act um, around planning specifically. Um, and that is a feature of a number of the amendments that are currently being discussed in Parliament at the moment as to whether the 15 years that they've given is enough, but should be longer, shorter, and um, how, how that should happen, how, to, how do we solve, I guess, what, what the pressure term in the building safety crisis already exists in terms of removal of flooding from these, these tall buildings. Um, but this developer levy will be applying to all new built higher risk buildings, or that's the plan at least. Um, but also where you're repurposing buildings, we thought right to start about repurposing, you know, office buildings between residential and, and so on. Um, you know, there will be a levy on, on all of that to provide a fund basically from which um planning removal can be can be funded. And that's that's difficult, it's a challenge. The government recognizes that not all developers um are uh, you know are um, obliged to remove cladding, they recognise that not all of them are responsible for, 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 for any cladding issues. So um, it would be interesting to see how that consultation um, shakes down. Um, we touched on the, the safety construction products. There's also going to be a new homes ombudsman scheme, again, all about that residential, the residence engagement piece. Um, from a, a practical perspective, I think initially, at least, there's going to be delay in additional costs, um, not least those hard stops at Gateway 2 and 3, where the building safety regulator is going to have to be satisfied as to the compliance of, of the buildings. Um, I think there's going to be increased monitoring of, uh, of construction work. Um, construction, obviously, is something that's already very used to quite a lot of monitoring and proactive inspection. Um, probably see a little bit more of that. There's also going to be increased costs because materials are likely to have to be a high specification to meet the, the requirements. Um, there is going to be time investment, um, also financial uh, and intellectual investment in, in being able to manage this. So if this would apply to your organisation, being able to manage, for example, the golden thread information, um, being able to understand fully what the building safety manager has to do, what the council person has to do, how they're going to do it, how they're going to coordinate with, with other people. Um, and I think probably some insurance implications as well. Um, you know, the perception of being involved of, uh, in higher risk buildings might lead to policy exclusions, um, maybe increased premiums for the like people designers perhaps, where they are going to have to sign on the dotted line to say, the design is safe. Um, so I think there will probably be some, some insurance implications uh, as well. Um, overall, there are going to be some pretty serious root and branch changes going on. Um, as I said at the start, this is just a bill for the time being, so it isn't law yet, but this bill or something like it will come into force. Um, so you know, looking at it now is really, really sensible. 
uh, as I said, the, the key thing I think will be uh, around competence and um, how that consultation determines how we will view competence um, in a building safety arena. But also, as I say, it will may be interesting to see how that that um, goes out into other areas of health and safety. So what what we really advise at the moment is if you think that this bill will impact on the organisation to have a look at it now, map out the impacts of the bill as it stands and have a look at the bill as it's going through Parliament. All of the information is, is freely available on the parliamentary website. And then start to look at how you'll prepare for it, because I think if you start to prepare on, on enactment day, that will probably be too late. Um, there is there are some grey areas still, so planning is, is you know, planning in detail is difficult. And um, planning in principle is, is not so difficult and is, is, is something we think is quite achievable. Um, and you know, as I say, I think that, that those who will succeed with this will be ready, ready to go as the bill comes into into force. Um, and so we'll be looking at looking at this piece now, educating themselves, educating the people um, in terms of how how they want to go about it. So I appreciate that is an extremely quick canter through the provisions of the bill. Um, it, as I say, it's huge in its scope. And um, I'm very, very happy to answer any questions that have popped up in the chat whilst I've been talking. Um, and uh, as I said at the outset, as I said at the outset, if there's anything that we don't get to or that I need to go and look at, I'm happy to do that for you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Rianne. That was an excellent presentation, very thought-provoking and lots of information in there we all need to go away and think about. Um, so, Matthew, I'll hand over to you for any questions, please. Yeah, perfect. Good morning, everyone. Um, apologies in advance, you can't see me. Um, I'm having technical problems. <laughs> the thought after all this time in lockdown, we've got those sorted by now, but hey-ho. Um, so we've got a few uh, questions, Rian. Um, one of the questions we had is, would we expect to see two principal designers, i.e. one for CDM and one for uh, the Building Safety Bill coming through, do you think? No, I don't think so. I think the idea really is to try and make uh, this as, uh, it sounds silly to say, as simple as possible, given the, the, the scale and the scope of it all. But no, the idea is, is, is to, to try and have those CDM duty holders um, really tied into the building safety regime so that you've got that consistency of approach. So no, I, I don't think we'd expect to see two of everything in that respect. Okay. And in terms of transition periods, um, you may well have covered this, but we did have a question um, a few moments ago saying, will there be any transition periods to put all these requirements together for existing buildings? Yes. Yeah. So um, on the slides, um, it was it was the slide that I had, um, it is taken from the government's website, but it's not necessarily, it's not very easy to see necessarily on the screen. So it'll be easier once you get the slide yourself. Um, but yes, there is going to be um, an 18 month leave time. So from the time the bill is enacted, um, we will get 18 months to put together the golden thread information. Uh, and that is for existing buildings as well as the, the, the new builds. Um, so I think the government suggested that the bill might get through in March of next year. I think we expect it sometime between spring and the summer recess of parliament. Um, and then there'll be then 18 months from that point um, to, to put it all together. But obviously, depending on how big the portfolio is and, you know, the nature of it, how old it is, what happens with it, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, there's certainly no harm in starting to um, dig out that information now because the golden thread is one of the areas where there is more information. So a number of the, the things we've talked about are still subject to consultation or subject to being fleshed out by the statutory instrument, for example. But there is a bit more information about, around what's expected from, from the golden thread information. So that's something that you, know, you can usefully start to, to look at now and to think about not only where, where is the information currently, but how we're going to store it going forward so that it is in that kind of useful and understandable format. Great. I mean, I think one of the um, things that you did cover off um, 
and um, that certainly uh, I've noticed from people talking about the Building Safety Bill is this possibility that in due course um, it, it will become applicable to, to lower rise buildings if you like and I think one of the obvious strands is probably around you know whether it's really the height that's the issue or whether it's the construction or more importantly who's in it uh, what, what what are your views on that do you think that there will be this this slight shift in emphasis from sort of height towards more the actual use or construction well I mean the the this was a real part of the consultation before the bill was um, before you know they really put pen to paper in terms of drafting the bill, um, and people were saying you know let's not be prescriptive about the height or the number of stories. Let's look at um, you know the, the actual characteristics, as I say, and that has come up again now, as, as I mentioned in the. Um, in the amendments to the building safety bill, um, whether or not those amendments will be accepted, obviously, will be a, a debate around that. And um, certainly, one of the things that we're being asked frequently is I've got a few buildings that are over that threshold, but I've got quite a lot that are not. What should I do? Should I start to apply the building safety bill regime to, to all of them? Um, and there are a number of businesses that, that are, will be doing that because they just think, actually, this is a decent framework. I, this, I can go with this in terms of being able to um, you know, have one way of managing the, 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 the stock, if you like. Um, so I think there may be a bit of movement on that, but it's really difficult to say at the moment. As I say, a lot of this is happening um, at, at, at committee stage. Um, and you know we are seeing the same arguments coming up again and again and again. I guess it just depends on the strength of those arguments when they actually get into a parliamentary debate about it. And I guess I mean also flowing from some of the, the common issues that um, certainly uh, our clients have been, and, and colleagues have been talking about is around the role of the building safety manager and. Um, what what sort of criteria are organisations going with? Because I'm aware that some are going for a a more people friendly person because of this more engagement with with residents and and that sort of very um, front facing sort of you know personable uh, person if you like. And some are going for quite a technical role. Um, of course, I think the building. Um, safety manager is, is going to be quite a critical role going forward. What, 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 what's your views on that? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, the, the need to engage with residents and how, they're going to be the space of the residents engagement strategy in that sense. Um, and so, yeah, the building safety manager role will be absolutely key. Um, I think, as I said, for the most part, it will be a, a corporate appointment. You do in that sense, you know, that's quite, an, quite unusual, as you know, to have you know, this need to identify one person who's not taking on all of the legal responsibilities, but who's the face of it. Um, and I think people will take different views depending on what their building is and what's happening. You know, for a new build, for example, you might go for that, not PR role, but, you know, I know what you mean by you, where you're going for somebody who is that more friendly face. Um, in an older building, you're likely to need somebody with the technical mouse to spot you know, the interactions that you get with older buildings as they start to require more significant refurbishment or um, maintenance and, and what's happening and when you've got best looking buildings, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think, I think there'll, there'll, there'll be a, a range mm. of options that people take, but I think there is definitely going to be a training requirement around that. Um, I think that's going to be something that um, organisations will want to look at not just from the perspective of how, um, you know, the day-to-day -day responsibilities, if you like, but also the interaction of being, a, the interaction being a building safety manager from a legal perspective, um, you know, being the face of the building to the building safety regulator, what does that mean? How does the, build, you know, the, the person, the building safety manager, protect, protect the corporate building safety manager in that, that sense as well? Um, so I think there's, 
it's going to be quite a lot to think about in those two new roles, both the um, the uh, accountable person and the uh, building safety manager. And I guess one one final point. Um... Uh, and I guess it's often the way in legislation that you and I deal with on a day to day basis is that, of course, sitting behind all of this is an enforcement strategy and um, uh, and provisions within the bill itself for committing uh, uh, or creating criminal offences for non-compliance. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think you know, if we look at the, the bill um, and its possible timeline, so if it's coming into, say it comes into force spring of 2022, we will be well into 2023 and 2024 before a lot of the provisions are, you know, before that a lot of them are implemented because of the amount of time it's going to take organisations to get everything up to speed. Um, so we're probably a little bit of a way off knowing exactly how they're going to flex those enforcement muscles, if you like. Um, the early indications, as I said, were around regulating by cooperation, by discussion, trying to iron out issues early on. But of course, remember, this is the HSC. So, you know, they have, they are very well practiced as an enforcement agency. Um, that is an enormous part of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I think it would be wrong to think that they won't also do it here. It might take a while to was to see the shape of it and how they'll go about it. But, you know, the, the bill creates numerous criminal offences, um, a lot of them very similar to health and safety offences that we already um, know and love. Uh, and, you know, I think we will see, we will certainly see some cases where the HSC will, or the building safety regulator will resort to prosecution, certainly resort to serving those compliance and stop notices that I talked about. Um, and, you know, again, that's something to building safety managers, council persons that I have in mind, but also anybody involved in, in that whole process. We've talked about a number of different organisations that put a, a, a bit of a different complexion on CDM issues, because obviously there is then this wider um, scope to, to consider. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's certainly something to, to bear in mind, and just having that interface with the regulation. And really, if they are going to regulate by cooperation as a corporate entity having a strategy for dealing with that because I think you know um, businesses who deal a lot for example with the environment agency are really good at that because that's the way the environment agency works they tend to do a lot less enforcement criminal enforcement and a lot more talking it through let's find a way um, but that takes skills from a corporate perspective as well to understand how to interact with them on that level so I think there's going to be quite a fine balance and I think there's going to be uh, quite a lot to consider at that point. Brilliant. Well, um, there's no further questions. So, uh, Ray, do you want to bring us to a close? I do. So, uh, again, an excellent presentation, very informative. We've had lots of questions coming in. I think it's uh, caused an area of big discussion. Some um, excellent answers there and some uh, informal information there uh, from uh, Rianne. Thank you ever so much for your time and mm -hmm. your your knowledge and experience in delivering that for us. I'm sure both the committee and our Umber, Umber uh, branch members appreciate your time and effort in that. So thank you very much. Um, if we was face to face, we'd be giving you a round of applause. So we can't do that, unfortunately. <laughs> but massive, uh, thank massive you, thank you from us all.